No, skepticism is awesome. There it's you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. again our room is about the same size as last year we have you know mark disler from about abrupt, abrupt media back there he did all this amazing stuff um i have the placebo effect of being hot under the lights even though those don't have any heat so it's kind of full i like that it's kind of fun um so i'm going to do the kickoff pretty much how i have for the past few years i'm going to let them tell everybody who they are and then what their kind of focus is, and then I'm going to leave it to the audience. Again, like last year, don't raise your hand, anything like that. If you have questions for these people, line up at the microphone that's right here. Everybody can then hear you, and then, you know, so everyone will know what's going on, and then you'll, you'll be on the big screen, which is kind of cool. Um, maybe, if you're afraid of big, your face on a big screen, well, you know. You have issues. We, we can work through those. I think there's some people that are, are you know, guests, guests for the track that are like you know, psychologists. You can take an appointment with them, make them a little money. They probably like it. Um, so I'm going to start with. Let's go to the guys' side first. We have a guys and girls. Maybe we're going to have a battle later on at the panel. <laughs> Although Desiree joined the, the, the boys, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with Brian Brushwood. He's texting. This is actually he sees I'm actually, it. Actually, in my defense, I'm trying to promote watching uh, everything on the live stream here. Oh yeah. So are we out there in live streaming land? Hi. Uh, we have live streaming everything in this track room. Probably not the crystal ball room, which is downstairs. <sighs> Just it, it's it's difficult. I, I don't know if we can even do it. Right now, we have dongles to do it, but it's it's, well, it's a, the basement hello. level is just a little crazy. So. So yeah, say hi to their live stream. There's already people on it. We are, I just recently saw it. So Brian, take it away. Uh, hi guys, my name is Brian Brushwood. Uh, I spent about 10 years touring colleges with the Bizarre Magic Show where I eat fire and stick nails in my eyes. And about four years ago, I started hosting a show on the internet called Scam School, which we call the social, the, the only show dedicated to social engineering at the bar and on the street, which is a fancy way of saying we teach you how to trick people into giving you free beer. Um, and uh, uh, as far as uh, skepticism goes, around uh, 2004, I started hosting a live stage show called Scam Sasquatch and the Supernatural, where I explained it's sort of a, um, uh, I don't know, a guided tour through uh, all the different uh, greatest hits of uh, skepticism. And um, now I'm here. That's great. Second year. Second year, yeah. And the semi-new president of the JRF. It's the second year now, right? Yeah. In, yeah. in the second year. Thank you, Derek. I am DJ Grothy, president of the James Randi Educational Foundation, and we have a table out uh, on this floor, kind of back there. I invite all of you to go to it. We have a lot of nice freebies. You'll want to make sure you take a gander. Um, this is, I think I've been to uh, all of these, uh, I think this is the fourth, and uh, I, like you'll hear throughout the weekend, uh, we really uh, owe a lot to Derek uh, and Swoopy for really inspiring this fantastic means of outreach. Uh, so thank you, Derek, and That's welcome everyone fault. to Skeptrack. It's all your fault. Don't applaud me. <laughs> then we have Desiree, who has skeptically speaking. Have we heard her show? It's really cool. Here she is. Hello. Um, I was whoa. I was just drug up here, so I haven't fully had my coffee yet. So uh, she, she's filling in for Rebecca Watson. Stuff. You're on drugs. Uh, not yet. <laughs> Caffeine's a drug. And Rebecca can sit on my lap when she gets here. So. Nice. <laughs> I'll move over to Margaret Downey, who's moving around microphones. Yes. Is this one working? Yes. yes. Okay. Good. So my name is Margaret Downey, and I've been an atheist activist for almost 30 years. Uh, and during that 30 years, I was always a frustrated thespian. I always wanted to figure out you know, ways to teach and ways to present my message using costumes. And then I was invited to Dragon Con, and wow, a whole world opened up for me with costuming. Love it. Um, I've been, this is my fourth year. 
fourth year. And um, I want to keep coming and I want to encourage people to find this joy that I have found at Dragon Con and representing skepticism, representing critical thinking skills is more fun than you can imagine. So I hope you'll talk to me later about some ideas I have for next year. Yeah, we'll get to that right after. Sarah. Hi. The, 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 the nice little meek girl who's really pretty right now. <laughs> she would do out here and make, do her makeup. She does, I told her she doesn't need it. But she does uh, manga, anime. Has seen her stuff before? It's really cool. Yeah, see? She, they have fan, you have Yay. fans. Hi. <laughs> There's the two of you. <laughs> I'm sure there's more. I'm embarrassed. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm a writer and illustrator specializing in producing manga graphic novels. Um, I have a big interest in science and skepticism and try to incorporate that um, into my work, especially my new series, Legend of the Star. Um, I'm Canadian and I'm also a TED Fellowship member, for those of you familiar with the prestigious TED conference. Wow. Yes. <laughs> I'm more and impressed that you're Canadian. And this is my first Dragon Con. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't tell by her accent? Sure. There are two Canadians on this panel. So, like Margaret, you... <laughs> Margaret just brought up something a little How bit. How did this turn into a Canadian witch hunt? What just happened? <laughs> <laughs> you started it. Or Margaret brought up a little bit about some things she was talking about for next year. Why don't you tell people a little bit about that? Okay. Um, I do have those slides if you... Want. Oh, okay. Well, um, you'll find some free literature that we printed up to advertise what we want to do in 2012. And um, what we want to do is uh, participate in the Dragon Con Parade. So we have some, um, pay, uh, some flyers where you can get the details about what that would involve. And what we're thinking is since the logo for critical thinking and asking questions is a magnifying glass, we thought it would be fun for people to decorate a magnifying glass, match it with a costume, come to the parade. We'll have a banner, a street banner that will walk in the parade, advertising skepticism. And speaking of the banner, we need donations to make this banner. The banner is going to cost us about $500, but we can do it. And then that way we can be a part of Dragon Con and promote skepticism by being out there and having fun at the same time. Do you want me to do the other one? Yeah, do both of them. Okay. Uh, I'll get the other one up for you. But yeah, okay. talk about it. I'll, I'll do it. So um, don't forget to pick up a flyer, please. And think crazy. You know, think <laughs> how you would want to do a, um, a magnifying glass. Because if we have any money left over from buying the banner and uh, participating in the parade, there will be prizes, right? 2012. Prizes. Yeah, for the best. For that, that one's that's cool. Best I, costume. I didn't know about the prizes. That's well, only if we have enough donations, Derek. Uh, uh, or enough people to do it. <laughs> and then the next thing we're going to organize is called the Essence of Carl Sagan. Again, there's <coughs> a flyer uh, over there at the side of the table, and and what we're promoting is Andron wants to hold this Essence of Carl Sagan contest, where people will have um, a few minutes to present their version of Carl Sagan. So we have different categories. The humorous Sagan, Sagan the skeptic, Sagan space. If Sagan were a woman, um, Sagan the educator, Sta Sagan the steampunk. So, you know, you can really get creative and even come up with your own expressions of Carl Sagan. So um, we're hoping that a whole year will give you time to think about that and participate. Music's encouraged, anything that you just can go wild on stage with your interpretation. And hopefully Anduron will be one of the judges and we're talking to Neil deGrace Tyson about being part of that too. Since Cosmos is coming back on air and yeah, and Neil deGrace Tyson will be the new Carl Sagan. So, so hopefully Anne will come and she'll convince Neil to come so we can talk about the new Cosmos next year as well. So mm -hmm. how cool is that? All <laughs> Thank right. you, everyone. So uh, nobody's lining up. So do you want me to ask questions? Because nobody else wants to. Sarah, what'd you have for breakfast this morning? <laughs> I'll bore people into coming to the microphone. Uh, <laughs> nothing yet. Uh, oh, Although nothing? I, I must say for the Sagan tribute, I always 
pay tribute to Sagan by drinking Cosmos. So <laughs> there you go. Way of and eating apple pie. You had one of those From this scratch. morning? Is that yes. what you're saying? From scratch. Yeah. Uh, and we'll probably have a bar at the event <laughs> serving Cosmos, um, you know, virgin Cosmos. Or <laughs> you, can do, you, can do other, you can do the other type too, you know. Bring your, no, bring your own husband. No, actually, you really can't do that, sorry. <laughs> now, is this the panel to talk about issues that are important to skeptics? Yes, of course. It's the kickoff. That's what the people are here are for. Great. I don't, nobody, tell me if you don't want to hear, learn about skeptic stuff while you're here. <laughs> so, no, nobody, that's actually across to the Sheridan. Yeah, actually, here, I'll ask, uh, pretend I'm up at the mic. Let me ask you guys. Um, uh, this is a very peculiar event for skeptics uh, in that you have this awesome cross-section of people who have an intense interest in things that are supernatural, whether it's science fiction or fantasy, but you also have uh, people who are, are excited to go on ghost adventures, that kind of stuff. And then also, uh, you know, obviously, this, the skepticism angle as well. Um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to do outreach, and I think there's a lot of people who have an interest in something but don't necessarily believe it. I think uh, that most of the skeptics up here on stage um, are science fiction enthusiasts, and, and we do read fantasy, uh, and we enjoy a lot of things that are, that are obviously, if somebody were to make a business claiming they could do these things, we'd be very upset with them, but we love them as a fantasy, and I, I find that uh, Dragon Con happens to be a perfect place for that type of outreach. I'm curious um, what, what the opinions of the rest of the panelists are as far as events like this versus something like the amazing meeting where you know 100% of everyone who is there is there because they're part of the skepticism movement. We'll start on with Sarah. Well, this is the first time you've been this one. You came to TAM this, this year, so. Yeah, yeah, it was my first TAM. Uh, this is my first Dragon Con. I have been to, um, to a few like anime and, and Comic-Con like events before, but no, I think it's great. You know, we can uh, blend in and we're secret agents of skepticism. <laughs> Not very secret right now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> There's a big sign out there. It says we are. I think it's a good opportunity, you know, like at TAM. I mean, I love TAM. It was, oh. it was great. Um, but yeah, at, here we do have opportunities, you know, to, uh, to reach out to people, you know, outside of skepticism. <coughs> I well, I would like to see a, a bigger effort in um, reaching out to those people that might have an interest. Uh, we just look like everyday people walking around at Dragon Con, and, and I think that we should, <laughs> we should have either a, a Skeptic little... Skeptic dress-up day? No, a little, a little name tag that says, ask me about skepticism, and be ready, or a t-shirt, ask me about skepticism and be ready with three good talking points, quick elevator speech type thing, and, and get someone who, who notices and says, oh, tell me about skepticism, that you're ready. You're saying, oh, come to the next one. It's at 4 o'clock, and you'll love it. It's in, in the Hilton, and, and, and just really push it forward. Mm. That's what I'd like to see done. That's I right. Tam is a fantastic place to rally your base. You already know that everybody there is, is a skeptic. Um, you can do some really amazing activities, some, some activism, and that's usually what I'm interested in, because uh, while I think it's fun to sit around and talk about all the stuff we know, I really want to do something with that understanding. Um, so this is a place that you can sort of, you can find those issues that are of interest to skeptics and interest and, and that interest other people outside of the community and maybe build around that. So things like uh, the dousing. They've, they've seen it other places. Maybe they want to find out how, what it's actually like. They come here for the, the paranormal track. They want to hear about um, the ghosts in their basement and then they find out that maybe there's some real science behind that. I think these are good entry points. All good comments. <clears throat> um, Tam, uh, this last year in July, 1,672 people was the wow. final number. We thought it was 1,652, but over the weekend, a couple more people showed up. Um, and just over half of the people who came to Tam were new. So in one sense, Tam itself is a kind of outreach event. It's reaching new people. But Dragon Con <clears throat> is much more of that. And while building community is very important, even skeptics and secular types like to kind of love on one another <laughs> in, in the community sort of sense. Yeah, I wanna, <laughs> we don't have that panel, though. I'm um, sorry. We could do it next year, at, maybe. At, 
at uh, Dragon Con, the opportunity exists that we've all touched on to actually reach new people who aren't self-identified skeptics, who may indeed be skeptics but don't know that there's a tribe or a community they could plug into. <laughs> so I mentioned the JREF table. There are all kinds of organizational tables out there. At the JREF table, you can get free million-dollar checks. Uh, uh, million Don't dollar paranormal yet. challenge checks. So you're, you go around Dragon Con this weekend and someone's peddling woo woo, as Randy calls it, give them a million dollar check and say, prove it. Here's a million dollars uh, you can apply for if uh, you can back up your claims. There are those sorts of outreach opportunities here at Dragon Con, and that's what's so inspiring about this event. Uh, if any of you know, uh, Maria Murbeck, uh, I think she'll be here uh, this weekend. She was first introduced to skepticism as a movement here at Dragon Con, and now she's by by Randy. Uh, by Randy, and now she's a uh, a growing leader in this uh, little subculture, this I, movement. I, I, and I saw so, her earlier. Is she here? Uh, no, she was here just earlier. But and she... and so that's an example of how th this event is so important in terms of outreach. But. It, it, I'm going to go, I'll make you answer your own question next. Okay. Because he mentioned that everybody, whoever here, who here <laughs> is, hasn't yet identified as a skeptic or just trying to find out about it or didn't hear about it until Dragon Con, anybody out there? Oh, no, not this time. <laughs> well, then again, it's we like, this is kind of like a... For fourth, how many of you is this your first skeptic event? That's a good way to Oh, that's a bad, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and, and now... <laughs> It, I could be wrong, but it looks like that's about half yeah, of the people it was about in the half. audience uh, that, for whom this is your first skeptic event. That shows the power of this as an outreach vehicle. So that's impressive. All right, Imagine Beth. what it's going to be like after the parade next year. <laughs> oh, God. Exactly, exactly. You're going to make me get a bigger room. Um, <laughs> Brian, answer your own question. Oh, uh, actually, uh, I mean, I, I, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. The one thing that I, that I would, I, I don't even want to say disagree. I would just question about the, um, uh, I love the idea of the million dollar checks. I think it's a fantastic vehicle. I think that's something that should be handed out to all the people. I don't know what the benefit would be to, hand, to, to uh, giving it to the, the psychics, though. Because mm -hmm. if somebody's running a table there, you're not going to convert them. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're too invested. May, maybe not at a table, but if you're having a nice barroom chat or something with someone and they're, they're, uh, kind of promoting their, one, one of us might call it an income poopery, their, right. their uh, un, I like that. unsupported <laughs> beliefs. Uh, you know, these are ways to engage in conversation. Right. Well, and, and, and I do think as a vehicle, as you know, I think it should be something that you should hand out the checks left and right at the bar. Like, hey, man, you got a friend who claims he can read minds? Here, you know, throw him this. Million dollar challenge. Right. Split the money with me. Yeah. There you <laughs> go. Oh, we have people on the mic, so let's go there. Hello. Oh. Wow. <laughs> You're powerful. You didn't know it. Uh, my name's Bill. Hi, Hi Bill. Hi, Bill. <laughs> and I'm a skeptic. I've been a skeptic for four years. Might be years. a skeptic. Uh, there's, a, there's a new show on Discovery called Curiosity. And the first episode had Stephen Hawking talking about whether or not you needed uh, God to explain the beginning That's of the wonderful. universe. And I was wondering if any of you guys saw that or if anyone else saw it and what you thought about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. I, yeah. In fact, I got a, a links all through my Facebook page of other people who had seen it and mm -hmm. loved it too. Uh, just having him say the words that, you know, there probably is no God was just great. <laughs> well, they, an actor <coughs> did most of his saying. Yeah. If it was the robot voice for the whole episode, that would Well, been. you know, I consider it his voice. <laughs> it works. Anyone else see it? Or just... Anyone else on the panel? Yeah. I, I did see it. I yeah. think what's exciting is that the market will uh, support programming like that on TV. It's uh, infrequent that you see on TV such kind of hard-hitting skepticism. Uh, uh, you know, I'm here in my role as president of the James Randi Educational Foundation, so I'll be talking about that a bit. But two weeks ago, some of you may have seen a whole hour uh, on national television, primetime nightline focused yeah. on skepticism yeah, cool. of the paranormal. And people are saying it's the kind of most hard hitting show that's been in the media in a very long time. That suggests to me that things are changing a bit. It's now more okay than it was before to talk your skepticism and to be, to have a reporter challenge James Von Prague and say, are you sure you didn't just Google me? You know, <laughs> uh, uh, you say you're talking to deceased loved ones, but you're, aren't you doing cold reading? I mean, that's, 
that's something that isn't normally in the media. The Stephen Hawking uh, episode you're talking about, that's not normally on TV programming. So I, I'm hopeful that this is uh, the beginning uh, or uh, an example of a current trend. And Cosmos is coming. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, that'd be really cool. And Bra. Penn and Teller have a new one on Discovery too coming. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Which I think is a better move. I mean, the HBO stuff was great. Or Showtime? Showtime. Yeah, Showtime. Yeah. But being not on paid cable will be much better. Yeah, they'll have a much bigger audience. But I think their show is not only about skepticism. Right. It's kind of general uh, uh, kind of discovery well, that's uh, why channel. That's, sort of well, stuff. that's kind of the myth Mythbusters. They're exactly. skeptic stuff, but right? you never, no, most people don't even know it. notice it. Like Scooby-Doo, same right. thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> No, not the movie. The movie was crap. Yes. <laughs> the movie does not count. Guys, shush. <laughs> what was that voice? <laughs> it was Mr. Happy Pants. Yeah. <laughs> Next. Okay, I've um, got two quick little things. Uh, one, uh, Brian was talking about our outreach here at DragonCon. I was thinking about, they were talking about SciCon being in New Orleans this year and being... Halloween weekend, and apparently there's going to be plans of going out and doing um, some of the quote supernatural tours. And I'm just wondering, are they ambushing the poor tour guides, or are they actually letting them know that this is going to be a skeptic group going in there? I don't know. I don't, I know. I don't. Nobody here. Uh, well, all right, well first of all, CSI right and I, yeah, and I actually I don't know any of the details about this, but I will say that unequivocally that um, uh, while I don't believe in Sasquatch, I think he's awesome. Uh, while I don't believe in ghosts, there's nothing more fun than staying in a haunted house overnight. I mean, it's, you can, and, and, and let's face it, um, even going on one of those ghost tours can be a healthy, skeptical experience. You can, you can be scared, you can be excited, you can have thrilling experiences, you can have one of these awesome false positives that raises, you know, you get that adrenaline rush, you're so excited, like, oh, what if this is it, what if this is the proof? But, but as long as you run it through the filter of common sense and, and reason and double blind tests or whatever. So, uh, I mean, as a result, like, I, I'm, I hope they don't go and ruin the experiences, you know, but, uh, and when I say ruin, that doesn't mean not be skeptical or not say, not apply the filter of like, well, it could be that, you know, you know, these are dowsing rods, I got trembly hands, that kind of thing. It's fine to, to give alternate uh, experiences, but I think skepticism does itself a disservice if it if it becomes dogmatic and it gets a reputation as being a, the guys who shit on people's parades and that's what I, that's very important that I don't want to do because uh, and that's something we try to do in the weird things podcast where we um, uh, all three of us very much skeptics we don't believe in Sasquatch but we will spend over an hour be like no seriously that door gets kicked in Sasquatch comes in what physically do you throw at him to make a difference <laughs> you know and and that's um. Uh, <laughs> and so, it's, well, what's the answer to that? Uh, uh, well, the answer is the microphone is big and heavy, but uh, you get out of there. <laughs> but, uh, but, but the the point is, as far as as far as outreach stuff, um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have any problem with those tour guides as long as uh, as long. And and I, j I would just hate to see skeptics make a bad name for themselves. Yeah. So hope. go and have fun, not ambush, huh? Yeah. But that's one of the things we always talk about: the difference between skepticism and cynicism. Mm -hmm. And in my impression, skepticism is still fun. You can still have fun with it. Cynicism, not so much. You've already decided what the answer is. Yes. And nobody else has fun around you is the biggest problem. <laughs> well, I, I do like going on these ghost tours, and I'll ask the tour guide questions. We were in Prague um, last year, and it was, you know, underneath the city and all of these, ooh. James ooh. Prague? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I would just ask questions like, you know, well, couldn't that just be leaking water? Um, couldn't that just be an airflow or... You know, what a, do you really believe that? And, you know, by the end of the tour, I wasn't disruptive. I was just making people think, you know, as I asked this, these very innocent questions and, and trying to plant little seeds about what could really be happening. And at the end of the tour, the tour guide um, t took me aside and he says, I don't believe any of this either, but it pays my bills. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's very honest. Yeah. And a second little thing, quick, um, Mark was saying about having a little badge or something like that. Well, I got some extra placebo bands from Australia, if y'all want any, so. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Can I have one? 
I got mine. Uh, real quick, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, the Skeptic Bros out of uh, Australia put together these bands. If you've ever seen any of the power bands with the holograms in there, uh, luckily they've already been kind of out at several times. But uh, this, this may be one of the best uh, gestures, one of the best public displays. Uh, they created these placebo bands that have a hologram on there that uh, amazingly are just as effective as the uh, power bands. And they're a little cheaper too, he just gave some out. So. I'd like to say something about a pl placebo band. I took my grandson to a swap meet and he was very interested in those magnetic bracelets. And you know, we, we stopped and, and I said, you know, just ask questions. Now, you know, remember, People will tell you things that are not true. So this woman who was trying to sell him a bracelet said, do you play sports? And he said, oh, yeah. She said, well, this will help you with sports. And this will heal your arm if it, if it starts to hurt. And, and, you know, I even have a friend, and it cured her cancer. Oh. And I was so furious with that. And I said, oh, Cameron, don't. Don't believe everything people say. They just want to sell you something. So she said, get out of here. <laughs> and, you know, we were thrown out of her booth. But he turned around and he says, do you call for a magnet when you have a heart attack or 911? <laughs> Rock on. In, in his defense, he did exactly what you said. He just asked questions. <laughs> True. Yeah. Very cool. Next up. Um, mine follows the power balance stuff, too, a little bit. Is there anything in the U.S. that we could do that's more tangible and solvable, like the power balance bans or the 1023 campaign that we can focus on? Here's what we can really do. We can try to, okay, here's the thing. Like Walmart, right? If you go to the pharmacy section, it has all the homeopathy yeah, and the real stuff. stuff. You're never going to get, get them to take away the homeopathy stuff because it makes them a lot of money. So don't go there. What you really want, what I think we need to do, is get them to actually separate it out of the pharmacy section where the real drugs are. So and it's labeled over there. So that when I'm there, I mean, I've been in, in there. My wife actually was pissed one time because she went there to the she was very pharmacy. Drunk. And she, she picked up um, some form of female drug. She got home. It was homeopathic. It was right next to the real stuff. So well, and they've gotten smarter in their labeling yeah. too. They'll 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 borrow the they trappings. Look like pharmaceuticals. Yeah, well, and, they, and they'll have they'll have the name of the drug, the brand name, and then they'll have uh, you know two Latin sounding words underneath it, yep. giving you the impression that it's something real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing that's tangible here in America. We could do. You're not going to get them to take it out of their store, but we can make it so that it's not in the drug section because it's not yeah. drugs. It's water or whatever it might be but it's not real. And, and as a supporter of free enterprise, I'm not sure that any of it, uh, I, that I would want to advocate telling companies you can't sell that uh, it, it, if it's not actually harming people. There's a big question about the harm that homeopathy causes. It can if you do it as opposed to real medicine. But I'm glad that you mentioned the 1023 campaign because earlier this year we helped organize a number of these events all over the country. That's activism where you're not just getting together no although there's not a problem with this, except if it's the only thing that you would do, you're not just getting together over drinks and talking about another nonsense belief you don't believe in, but you're doing something. And that's the, that's the kind of organizing that comes out of events like TAM or Dragon Con. You're actually uh, uh, kind of putting your activism where your ideals are. What yeah. is that? The 10 what? The 1023 campaign is... Uh, uh, now a worldwide uh, activism campaign uh, organized or originally from folks in the UK uh, uh, involved with uh, Mercy Side Skeptics, Mercy yeah, side yeah. skeptics. Uh, in, uh, in England, uh, where it kind of inspired by what James Randi has done for a number of years, which is overdosing on homeopathic sleeping pills in his talks. Uh, they have organized kind of uh, uh, overdose events all over and new elements of the activism campaign have cropped up so it's not just m mass staged kind of fake suicides uh, or, or overdoses I mean um, but there's also letter writing to uh, executives at the pharmaceutical companies that make a lot of money on this um, and uh, the executives at the, at the uh, um, pharmacy chains that sell it. So it's a campaign that you can find more information out about, uh, more information about at uh, randy.org or just Google 1023. Uh, uh, and 
it, I, I think that's an example of great skepticism. Other skepticism uh, surrounds the vaccine movement, so if uh, the anti-vax uh, organizers. So if you're looking for examples of activism, there are a lot of great examples within the skeptics movement where we're not just getting together, wringing our hands and fetching about nonsense. We're actually doing well, something. Well, on that, saying, on that point, uh, I think it's in the Marriott that we're actually hosting a free vaccine clinic for flu, That's pertussis, so right. and actually they're doing tetanus and some other things over there for free. For that reason, and uh, do not get the injection before you give blood. Well, there's also there's also you know give blood too. Do that because you know. Do that first. Well, Drangon to the past what, two years now in a row, we actually made the record for the amount of blood given, like in history, right? Last year, my girlfriend got the injection, then she couldn't get blood. Uh, yeah, you have to do your blood first and then get the injection. Thank you. I forgot about that. Uh, real, real quick, on, on those different outreach programs, uh, the, the, the two things that I think make for the best, um, uh, for the best scenario for, for outreach are, number one, framing your message in a positive way. Uh, it's not a matter, um, uh, skepticism will not do well if all we do is be the pouty-faced guys who say, no, 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 not real, not real. Uh, but, um, uh, for, but something like the placebo bans is fantastic because yeah, it's positive. It's like, yes, exactly. It's funny, and it also positively states like these work just as well as the original. And the, in, the inference people get is like, oh, I get it. The real one, you're, you're saying the real ones don't work. Uh, and that's the second thing that I think is important is that uh, one of the toughest things, the moment you try to tell people what they should believe, they will always clam up. They always put up their, their shields, and it's very difficult to make them believe anything, but if you set up a scenario where they gather where you're headed and they make the leap for their own thing, for example, and that's what I love about the overdose things. It's like, hey man, we're not saying anything except for watch this. <laughs> and then they, hey, they Bubba, figure out, they're like, this. they piece together like, wow, if that was a real drug, that would probably be a problem. Oh wait, I get it. You know, and that's, that's exactly, it, it should leave the final leap to the end person and it should uh, frame your statement in a positive way. Uh, if you want point. to know more about skeptical activism, there is a panel tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure quite what time it is, but uh, DJ's on it, and uh, a couple of us will be talking about this. Um, on that point about you know the overdoses that are fake, um, I don't know if anybody noticed that uh, Billy Joel's daughter, who's actually a singer now too, um, she got home, wanted to kill herself, went to the pharmacy, an actual drugstore, bought a bunch of sleeping pills got home, took them all, changed her mind, decided I want to live. She called 911. And then when, the, when she told the doctor, this is what we took, and then they got to the hospital, they pumped her stomach, all that. It was homeopathic. Oh. <laughs> and it was made in the news, but there's an example of, I mean, I mean, sure, somebody, that was a good point <laughs> at that point because it was homeopathic, but the point is that, you know, that's, where that goes, where somebody went to the dark drugs. Okay. <laughs> what did uh, you say? I, I get a, I'm, oh, I have an error. What does it say? No, no, oh, no it's, it's just, trouble okay, troubleshooting. <laughs> oh, okay. But yeah, so there's an example of somebody that should know better, but here's an example where somebody went to the pharmacy bought something that they were damn sure worked. Well, but, but, but uh, keep in mind also, they may in fact have known better, but do you really want to be the guy at the hospital who has somebody come in like, I'm trying to commit suicide, I overdosed, and be the guy like, you'll be fine. You know, I mean, you're not going <laughs> to, you don't want to, nobody wants to be that guy. I'm sure he didn't want to be that guy. But yeah, it was a very Joel, kick story. your ass, man. So, you know, and yeah, it, the out good, outcome was actually, well, we'll, Obviously, that was pretty good at the end because it didn't kill her. But I see what the problem is there. That meant the that problem is we need more potent drugs for people to kill yeah, themselves with. I think we're all on the same page here. <laughs> I hear what you're saying. If people don't want to be here, well, then they're gone. Okay? <laughs> no, it's just, it, it just shows you how important that, that thing. Um, next person. Hi, my name is Jim. I'm an astronomy educator and vice president of the Charlotte Atheists and Agnostics. And if you think that's not a tough place to do it, <laughs> I go to the airport on Billy Graham Parkway. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. 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 Uh, for those of us whose memories aren't quite as good as they used to be and whose eyesight's not very good, uh, you never introduced yourself. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm too, I'm not, I, I'm just, you know, standing here. Um, I'm Derek Colanduno. I am okay. one of the hosts of yeah. Skepticality. I know met, but the, like, oh. the, the podcast. Also, uh, we're so, silly with us. Uh, okay. 
happening and, with uh, the Skeptic Society. We have a booth out there. Um, and uh, and then Swoopy, my co-host, yeah. she actually runs the podcasting track, which is right next door right here. Yeah, I spoke to her earlier today. Yeah. Also, you didn't give last names for Sarah and Desiree, so for those of us who want to, oh. when we label the pictures on Facebook, we want to get the names right. I've, we forgot to get them to, to Mark, I guess. <laughs> Sarah. Mayhew. 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 I'm right under uh, usually Chewbacca, Peter Mayhew. Yeah. The program. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of funny. No, no variation. No. You, can, can you make the the, the bearable voice? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Maybe you are. And then Desiree Shell. Shell. It's S C H E L L. Do you have a portal gun? Thank you. Well, the eight people who got that joke are awesome. A geeky gun joke. I'm sorry. I'm trying con. You should all get that. Okay. Uh, next. Hi, I'm Karen Rogers. I'm the science writer for the Preeclampsia Foundation, which is a pregnancy-related disease that cool. really needs skeptical outreach. Mm. And I just wanted to say there's lots of opportunities in your daily, everyday life, your community, whatever, to start talking more about critically evaluating the evidence for your medical care, even with 20-year-olds who don't ever get sick. Because at some point, they're going to get pregnant. And we have huge... Boys do. Yeah, their, kid, their wives get pregnant, their kids die. And... Um, we have a huge problem with pseudoscientific cures. We have a huge problem with the fact that research into things like pregnancy is restricted pretty substantially by ethical issues. And so there's a lot of woo, you know, take this uh, yam if you're the right blood type and it'll make sure that you don't get sick. Take this rig and hold it over your belly and you'll find out it's a girl. Take the whatever. So just talking about it in your everyday community when it comes up on the topic of, of why people are making the choices they're making. You don't have to join some sort of specific outreach team to make a huge difference. That's right. That's right. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so the next person up is following exactly what Margaret wants to do. <laughs> Actually, my name's Lily. I'm a skeptic and also a kindergarten teacher, so I try in my everyday life to get, <laughs> use that natural curiosity to get all the children to think Logically, what have you guys? What advice do you guys have for um, advice for encouraging children to use critical thinking? Well, you, you'd be amazed at the type of language that is ignored um, when a, a child is speaking, and of course, they learn their language skills from their home. I'll give you another example. Um, my grandson, uh, we took him to Baltimore, and as we're driving down the street, he said. Oh, these buildings, they look haunted. And I said, no, no, there's no proof that ghost exists, and there's no proof that a haunting, there's no evidence of hauntings. These buildings look scary. They're scary looking buildings. So he thought about that, and you know, just using a different word to create critical thinking, I think is important. Um, whenever a child um, you know, does something superstitious, you might ask a question, you know, why did you do that? Do you really think that wearing a lucky sock is going to improve your game? Lucky sock? Or, you know, just <laughs> I mean, little things that, that, that children tend to do um, without thinking really hard about why they're doing it. So I just like to talk to children about that. Sarah, in your animes, do you, Manga, I'm sorry. <laughs> do you do, I mean, some, that has some of a re, re outreach to like younger people. Yeah, yeah. Um, my own stories tend to be for a little bit older of an audience, like probably teens. Um, but yeah, a big part of my work is using storytelling to try and, and convey um, to sort of the basic, you know, ideas behind skepticism just to present characters who, you know, think critically and um, who, you know, aren't scared to be wrong. Um, I think I think that's a big, one of my favorite things about skepticism is learning, you know, to be okay with being wrong about things. Um, and um, actually, it reminds me of one of, one of my uh, favorite things I've heard Neil deGrasse Tyson talk about is um, educating children and just how children are seem to be you know so naturally curious you know like if you know something like explaining that you know his kid would spill milk on a table and instead of like you know yelling at the kid 
the kid was just like looking at you know how it you know <laughs> the <laughs> physics of it, and he let the kid like watch it. Um, but just also explaining how you know they 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 really sort of seem to have to be taught like woo through adults. Mm -hmm. Like he's like. A kid, you know, if a black cat walks by, goes, oh, here, kitty, kitty, like, wants to play with it. They don't go, oh, now I can't walk that way, or they, you know, like... Unless the parent has yeah. ingrained that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, I think it's, yeah, really important to to that, to get them when they have that curiosity still. Uh, I love that question because... Uh, that's why I'm optimistic that this movement has a future, right? I'm not going to break out in song or something right now. But, what kind of song? Uh, you know, children didn't. are the future of <laughs> this. Um, At least one verse. And, and so uh, uh, to, I, I would uh, mention two things. One, there are a number of national organizations who are zeroing in on this problem, national skeptics organizations. One that I'm very fond of is the Center for Inquiry, and they run an every year and mm -hmm. they have an annual summer camp for children ages yeah. 7 to 12 or maybe it's 7 to 13. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that they have a lot of programming for kindergartners but uh, this is something they call camp inquiry. Uh, kids show up for a week and do programming on skepticism and critical thinking, science education uh, that uh, inspires their curiosity, kind of brings out their natural skepticism. Now that's paradoxical because most people imagine kids to be very gullible. You could always pull one over on a kid. But in fact, it's their natural curiosity that if left un unfettered and it's not stifled, turns into a good kind of skepticism along the lines of some of the other comments. The other thing I'd mention is uh, James Randi Educational Foundation, we've launched a program called JREF in the Classroom, where we're providing free resources to teachers around North America tied to national curricular standards, nat nat uh, national like science education standards and other standards. Uh, I, I'm not sure that there's a lot available for kindergartners, but for instance, uh, uh, junior high or fifth, sixth grade, uh, uh, take one of our modules, uh, teaching kit that helps children explore psychic powers and whether or not they're real and test whether or not they have psychic powers. So wow. rather than doing what uh, Brian was cautioning against, which is kind of just preaching to people saying, this is my statement of non-beliefs. Instead, it's an exploration, it's kind of a science experiment where then they come to the conclusion whether or not psychic powers, as an example, exist. So there are a lot of resources out there. I'd invite any teachers to avail themselves of them. And, the and, and, and what I like the most about that is that it causes, um, it forces them into the role of researcher and it forces them to understand the the ways that they can trick themselves and the criteria for uh, for winning or losing the, the challenge. Well, you can also use ha Mr. Pappy, Happy Pants, too. That's right, to scare everyone. Well, a lot, <laughs> a lot of children come to the Dragon Con Parade and there are just hundreds of, of, of children on the sidewalks watching and, and having a great time. Well, this year we're marching in the parade as the Frigatrisca Decophobia Treatment Center. And we'll have people dressed as doctors and nurses, and, and we can't throw items you know, out to the audience or anything. But I do have a, a little stamp, a black cat stamp, that I'll be offering to put on the hands of children. But just the very banner coming down the street will cause, I hope, children to say, what is frigatriscadecophobia? And, you know, cause some kind of language. What, what is that, Margaret? Define that for <laughs> folks. Fear, fear of Friday the 13th. The, the, now you have to say it three times fast. Frigatriscid, what the frig is that? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So, you know, I'm just, we're, we're doing it as an educational process. We're hoping it'll make people think that they'll seek us out. We'll, you know, put them through a little exercise of want to come inside and put an umbrella up or throw salt or, you know, do fun things. So, you know, it's a, it's, this is our way of educating and it appeals to children. I'm the body artist, so I really shouldn't say this, but I always wanted to like use, I, the way I became a skeptic is through my mom because my mom loves thrasher, disgusting, the most terrifying horror movies out there. And, you know, VCR, VCR machines came around right when I was like, you know, six or seven, when I was scared of that stuff. My mom loved to watch it, and she didn't want me to have to, like, she didn't want to have to, like, watch it in private. So she's like, she rent, went out and rented all, like, the worst ones, and she sat me down with her to watch them. Here I am, scared as hell. 
<laughs> and then the second time, like later on, like the first movie, she said, let's watch it again. I said, no, she said, no, we're watching it again. And then she would pause at like the first thing. She said, now, if you had a camera and you could do this, how would you make that happen? There you go. And Perfect. she made me do that for the entire movie. And then she did it with Poltergeist, and we did the same thing. And then when HBO aired the, when we got HBO later on, that they aired the making of Poltergeist, and she said, I just watched it. You were about right about 70% of the time. But it, it made me a skeptic, because I sat there going, if you can do this, so many other things can happen. So you might, I mean, you wouldn't use Poltergeist with kindergartners, <laughs> but you could do something like that, you know? like another movie and say, now how would you make that happen? So. Thank you. I have another, I have another quick question about um, an idea of how to approach something um, in the skeptic movement. A lot of, once again, think about with these, is that they're using sports stars and stuff like that to promote them. I mean, you got Power Band Stadium out there in California now. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Power Balance. Do we want to try, as a skeptic movie, try to target some athletes of not targeting ones who use it in, like, you're an idiot, but more find ones who don't, to be able to stand up and say, hey, look, I can do this on my own with my own skills. I don't need any of these, these um, BS things. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get a, because unfortunately, while part of us look at these, well, why people look up to these as, quote, role models, yeah, they're good, good athletes, but they're not role models for everything in life, people do. So why don't we use that and find some who we're willing to, now, think about things and help them make the outreach out to the kids and stuff who normally won't even look at us twice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, have somebody say, you know, I got this good because of hard work and yeah. practice and yeah. I don't, yeah. Well, sports has the highest percentage of superstitions. Uh, that and acting. A very, very superstitious community. The, a lot of athletes won't even change their underwear if they're on a winning streak. You know, it's it's really very difficult to find. No, that's, an that's actually an interesting point because uh, I obviously there are a number of actors who are outspoken in the skeptic community, but I can't think of a single sports figure right. that uh, that I associate with skepticism. Yeah. Well, you know, and it, what a coup it would be to have somebody who's you know on a Lance winning streak. I would say okay. Lance Armstrong is a possibility. Okay. Yeah, Lance Armstrong. Oh, next. Um, I'm similar to one of the former spe uh, question askers in that I'm also a teacher, but it's a little bit of a weird situation. It's junior high, high school age students, one on one, and there's a now they can you watch Poltergeist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of the students that I teach are ACT, SAT prep, and there was this one student that I had recently who the name Jonah was in one of the math questions or something, and that prompted him to say, like, just go on this thing about Jonah and the whale and stuff. And then he said, it's like, what people don't understand, it's really a, literally a big fish, not a whale. And I was so wanting to ask him, okay, what species of fish? Which one is possible to eat the person and then they don't get digested in three days? And but the thing was, you know, I mean, this is, again, this is his religious belief, and I'm not, I'm not there to teach ACT. I'm not there to, I mean, I don't know. I just, I find it interesting when this kind of stuff comes up, trying to toe the line of, okay, I want to get them thinking, but I don't want them to go home and say, oh, my God, my teacher told me all mm. this stuff, and now I'm getting the parents mad at me. Well, isn't sort of the goal as an educator not to indoctrinate, mm -hmm. but to ask questions and to foster mm -hmm. the students asking questions? So I... From my vantage, I wouldn't see anything wrong with asking the student, okay, tell me more about why you believe that or what kind of fish was it, uh, you know, asking questions. But not to indoctrinate the student in your worldview and say, look, your, your, your parents are wrong, your religion's wrong, et cetera. I think that's crossing the line. All right, right. The next up is the last question. Oh, I know. I, I didn't really have a question, but I had two kind of... Um, <laughs> I have two kind of like community outreach type things that people can do if you're in towns that don't have like really good skeptic um, movements. Um, so one, actually I'm glad people brought up the sports thing because you're totally right, athletes are really superstitious. So I play ice hockey and um, even in the weekend warrior kind of community, people are really superstitious. And just being in the locker room and saying things like when they're like, um, like okay, so one day our goalie forgot his cup. And he played anyway, and he played a great game. And so everybody's like, oh, you shouldn't bring your cup next time. And just being oh, there and okay. saying, no, please bring your cup next time is helpful, because it makes people think, OK, yeah, you're right. That's helpful. Silly. Yeah, I would, I was mad. I would say, yes, it's helpful. And the other thing is, 
The other thing is for anybody that works in like um, computer science or, or science of any kind, I would encourage you to um, look into local universities that do summer programs and look into teaching because um, I'm a, a grad student in biology and um, my, my coworker and I taught a rising eighth graders um, field ecology this summer. They're gifted in a gifted program at Vanderbilt. And obviously that's not, like we weren't teaching them skepticism, but we were out in the field and we were looking at plants and animals and talking about the adaptations they have and making the kids think about um, how this could have evolved and, and like what the animals might use that particular camouflage for and what kind of predator are they. And just asking them lots of questions like that and making them think of how, making them think skeptically without them realizing that they're being skeptical um, is really valuable. So um, any programs like that are like constantly looking for teachers to do um, well, the Center so for Inquiry is looking, and so is Camp Quest. So if you have any inclination to volunteer your time at the Center for Inquiry's Camp Inquiry or Camp Quest, there are a uh, please of do camp so. Camp Quests, right? All over yes, the country. All over the country. Of, these yeah. are skeptical and kind of humanist summer camps for kids all over the country. Right. Right. So we're going to do like, wait, wait, don't tell me at the end to wrap up. So you get about 20 seconds each. Go, hit it. it. Throw it to me? Yeah. You're uh, first. Listen, I think the greatest thing you guys can do for skepticism is uh, make sure to come to the NSFW show live, 8.30, <laughs> the Crystal Ballroom on Sunday. Pimping. That's his, you know, pimp skepticism. <laughs> so it, it looks like there are, uh, what would you say, over 100 people in this room? Uh, this room Probably. holds almost 300. So, so 150, 120. I, it looks to me about uh, over 100, maybe 120 or something in this room right now. And I've heard variously that at Dragon Con there are 30,000 people. I've heard there are 80,000 people. Uh, about 40, 45. So, I can verify there are 40 billion. Yeah, 40 billion people here. So the uh, about 40 on billion. the one hand, I think it's important for us to kind of hip hip our association. We're getting together. We're all skeptics. We're part of this community, and that's good. But to put it in perspective, we're a drop in the bucket compared to everyone who's not here, but who are he everyone who is at Dragon Con. So um, I think there are a lot more skeptics out there that don't know it than are in here with us. So uh, endeavor this weekend to do some outreach. Strike up a barroom conversation with someone about why you don't believe what you don't believe or why you do believe what you do believe. And I think the take home message from this panel for me is along the lines of what Brian was emphasizing earlier, that if you're a sourpuss curmudgeon, ain't nobody gonna wanna join your club. Right. Well, and, and you need to give a, a, a reason to come to the event besides because psychics are dumb. Right. You know, it's right. like it's got to be right. like, why do you come? You come, you know, to be part of an, an electric event. Right. All right. So, you know, skepticism is fun. And if you don't feel like it's fun, pretend at least for the rest of the week. <laughs> yeah. Pretend. Yeah. Hey, drink, you can pretend anything. But, but that's a good point. If you don't feel like skepticism is fun. And there are some people who are very serious about their skepticism. And that is, that is understandable. But if we can show other people that it is fun, and not only fun, but it is really, really productive in ways, that would be lovely. That it doesn't just exist within these rooms or in the pages of Skeptical Inquirer or in organizations. That skepticism can occur in a very practical way outside in the world. So come watch all the panels on skeptical activism. Bring so friends. bring friends, bring those people out there who you think might be interested well, so that we can actually start doing some stuff. We want Amway for skeptics. Like <laughs> um, so and you, you so I'm going to promote the parade in 2012 again because that's a really fun way to promote skepticism. You've got a whole year to design costumes and and crazy magnifying glasses. But um, I just want to tell you that you really should think ahead with three good talking points. An elevator 30 second speech about how joyful it is to be a skeptic and how wonderful your life is that you question everything and exemplify the joy of being a skeptic in your everyday life. Reality is cool. <laughs> All right, so we're out of time, but I'll let you talk. <laughs> no, skepticism is awesome. There you it's go. Like, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. You can see it all <laughs> That's actually a good point, too. I mean, the, skept uh, the matrix is, is skepticism defined. You know, it's yeah, questioning it yeah, that's a great. what you perceive as reality. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming to the first panel.
I'll see many of you later on, I hope.